Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. This will be part 374, and we're continuing with our discussion of the nations. Today we're going to take it to an overall level of um, the Luciferians in general. So we title this Luciferian Breakdown. We're looking at the nations. We're looking at the rulers of the nations. We're looking at how they affect the human race. Scripture indicates the human race is under the influence of myriads of races of Luciferian nations and rulers. <clears throat> the most dangerous and damaging are the serpent races and their ruler, Satan. Serpents are beings who were created initially to influence, to enhance, if you will, the creation by their wisdom and their speech. Let me ask a very quick question here. Yes. You said yesterday that the Terrible the nations are formed of many different families. I'm just going to use that word. Yes. Would you call that amalgamated or that mixed family a serpent race? No. No. Mm. It's different. Okay. Uh, they're called strangers. Okay. So it's an amalgam of beings that are from some other location that are there now operating. Well, yes. You just answered it. No, the serpent races are basically always identified as such. Okay. And we see that the, the identification deals with their wisdom and their ability to speak. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Genesis, third chapter, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The word subtle there comes from a Hebrew term arum, which means crafty, clever. So what's being said here is his wisdom became corrupted. And in such a way he was able to manipulate through a corrupted wisdom, things that he wanted to bring into being. Turn to Ezekiel, 28th chapter. And we see that ultimately he gives his ability, his subtlety, his corrupted wisdom into the hand of the Antichrist. Ezekiel 28, verse 3 and 4. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. So this ability, this wisdom, enables him to detect, to perceive things about people, insidious. But he, can, he, he has a deep insight through this corrupted wisdom about analyzing a person's makeup, their frailties, their vulnerabilities. Verse 4, with thy wisdom, with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasury. So we find that the, the, the Antichrist, because he has this ability given to him by Lucifer, translates it into acquiring wealth. Lucifer did the same thing. Drop down to verse... Uh, 
Um, let's um, chapter twenty-eight, and we want to pick it up in um, verse seventeen. <clears throat> Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom. By reason of thy brightness, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they shall behold thee. So he was able to initiate the mercantile system through his wisdom. Are we taking the word brightness here to be dynamis? No, splendor. Splendor. Mm. So the, lo the, the loving of himself is essentially what we're and yeah. caught up in his own beauty. Mm. Yes. Your statement, the last one you just made. By his wisdom, he's able to corrupt. Mm hmm. It just sounds like an oxymoron. If you have wisdom, you don't corrupt. We're talking about. <coughs> In his genre, he took what was perfect and he distorted it. So what you could, what he used to do on a positive scale, he does now on a negative scale. Through the corrupted, it's called wisdom. I don't understand how that could be called because wisdom. Because wi wisdom, when we read Paul, 1 Corinthians, this earthly wisdom is godly wisdom. It's not the same wisdom. Earthly wisdom is the ability to get things through manipulation, craftiness, subtlety, the capacity to use this to get what you want. People use this system through wisdom. And he talks about <coughs> he, confine, he confounds the wise. He's not talking about godly wisdom. He's talking about earthly wisdom. Intellectualism. Yes. Yes. The scribes and the Pharisees were very wise and thought that in their wisdom that they could gain say Jesus. They could uh, stymie him. And Jesus ran circles around him because he used godly wisdom. Their intellectual wisdom paled into insignificance. So we find two types of wisdom. Solomon had earthly wisdom. It was not corrupted but it reached a point where it was limited. He couldn't go beyond a certain point and translate it into godly God, What is godly wisdom? Comprehension of the spiritual. Now, do you suppose Solomon did that of his own volition? He decided to focus on things that were no, not good to focus on? Or what happened, Mr. Jones? He, so, did, he just compromised? Solomon reached the point where he tried to use his wisdom to explain things that could only be understood through godly wisdom. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Everything that was, still is, and there's no change. He understood how things operated through his wisdom. He could not go beyond his wisdom to understand things on a spiritual level. He's confined to the physical. And he talks about it under the sun, under the sun. Anything under the sun is referring to the physical environment. Solomon uses wisdom to make Israel rich dominate the whole region. He had a merchant fleet. He had uh, uh, the ability to bring things, craft things into being. The whole, the whole shot. He could not go beyond earthly wisdom. Why? Because of pride. Pride wouldn't let him. He talks around. He just says, there's nobody that's equal to me. I got nobody that you know comprehends what I understand. So that's the first failure right there. You can only go into godly wisdom through humility. That's why he writes the book of Ecclesiastes. So it's an expression of exasperation. I've come to this point. I can't go any further. There's no rationale for this. Then, of course, he starts to backslide. But let's go on. Satan has earthly wisdom. When he was made vice regent over the secondary creation, he had wisdom enable, enabling him 
to uh, uh, govern and administer the physical creation. Astral planes, physical planes, everything beyond that. He did not enter into godly wisdom, spiritual wisdom. Had he, he would never have fallen. Worldly wise men fall. Why? Because they trust in their earthly wisdom. <coughs> Let's go on. Turn to Psalms. No, turn to Matthew 10, 16. We're looking at the serpents and their ability to be wise and to use speech. Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Serpents are known for wisdom. When we say serpents, many people think he's talking about earthly snakes and um, lizards and things along that line. He's talking about spiritual intelligences. The serpents are all known for their wisdom. They have different levels in the serpent races and the levels have a level of wisdom. It's the way they were created. Turn to Psalms 140 verse 3. Now here, matter of fact, I'm going to do do verse 1 to 3. You'll get an, an understanding of what he's talking about, I think, a little better. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man. So he's talking about humans that are evil and violent, that are standing in opposition to him. They are engineering his downfall. And he knows it though he goes to the Lord. Which imagine mischiefs in their hearts. Continually are they gathered together for war. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. Sila. What is he saying here? He's saying... <coughs> that they destroy with their words. They have a wisdom that they have constructed to character assassinate him, disparage him, destroy him through their subtlety and their wisdom. And they're evidently they have an effect on him because he's going to the Lord and asking for the Lord to intervene. He's not talking here about them physically doing anything to him they're speaking and it says that things that they're speaking are destructive and they're having an effect Matthew 23 verse 33 Jesus accuses the scribes and the Pharisees of doing the same thing
you serpents, you generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? What is he talking about? When you look at the what he's indicting them on, it's the things they have spoken. You've hindered them from coming into the kingdom. You've distorted the word of God. You have distracted. You have caused destruction, eternal destruction to these people through your satility. People look at these individuals and he says they think you're holy. They think you're righteous. You give them this appearance of um, uh, holiness and purity, but inside you are ravening wolves. <laughs> Absolutely. And he says you have accomplished all this through your subtle wisdom, the things you say, the per perverted wisdom that you use. You know just how to manipulate them to get them to do what you want. They haven't laid a hand on these people. They don't have anything to do with uh, any physical opposition. The people follow them like sheep because of the corrupted influence they have through this subtlety. Satanic. Satanic. This is what you're seeing today in society. Absolutely. <clears throat> people have been manipulated through the speech of individuals who have given them an impression which is a total lie. Mm. So you could even say that the, I'm going to use the word not correctly, in, incorrectly, the inheritance of the tear is to be able to do exactly what you're talking about. Yes. To speak in such a way as to ensnare the person. Yes. Yes. How do rich people get rich? They manipulate wealth out of other people. The banking interests, the corporate interests, subtle, satanic, corrupted wisdom. They make things look good. They put people in slavery. We live in a debtor society. Why is that? Through satility. <clears throat> people are taken advantage of. Do they think that they're getting something for value? They're not. But let's go on. Principle Scripture teaches the human race would fall under the manipulating influence of the serpent races. This was all prophesied. Genesis 3rd chapter, verse 15. And I will put enmity, enmity is strife, antagonism, rivalry. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed, the serpent races, and her seed. Her seed comes out of the human race, it's the prototokis, sons of God. So you're going to have strife, and strife antagonism one day in the future between the sons of God and the serpent races. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So this was prophesied. Out of the human race which is in abject captivity to the serpent races has no idea of its true state, its true condition, because it's a satility that has erected the, the, the trap that it currently operates in. Out of the human race is going to come the true enemy of the serpent races that are going to ultimately triumph over them in Christ. Now, <clears throat> Scripture teaches in Christ, only in Christ, the saint has the power to nullify the serpent's influence, his craftiness, his subtlety, 
Luke, <clears throat> Luke, the tenth chapter, verses eighteen to nineteen. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. What was it that caused Satan to fall from heaven? Verse 17. The seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. They went out under the power of the Lord, and they shook the Luciferian foundation to its core from its leader on them. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power. The word power there is exousia, authority. Two, tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Serpents and scorpions, do you think he's talking about snakes in the, the lawns or in the jungles or something? You're going to go out here and trample over? No! He's talking about Luciferian spirits, the serpent races that are holding the human race in abject captivity through subtility. He says, I give you authority to tread upon them. How does that happen? It means to break their capacity. Notice what it says. Serpents and over all the power. Now this word is dynamis. It's talking about their supernatural power. So you have exousia authority to break their dynamis, their supernatural power. Just as Satan fell when the 70 went out. And that wasn't even the Lord. That was 70 people the Lord had sent out. You have power to take them down through Jesus Christ. So if they're erecting a stronghold, you have the authority to bring that thing down to absolutely nothing and cause that being to be neutralized. <clears throat> you wreck his influence and you limit him. Doesn't mean you can bring him into captivity. It means that he can't do anything with you through his subtlety and his wisdom because your authority neutralizes him. How's that done? Turn to Second Corinthians, tenth chapter. Second Corinthians, what? Tenth chapter. Verse 4 to 5. <clears throat> For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself above against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So it starts with our, it starts with our mindset. You... build a mindset that is a fortress stronghold in which anything that tries to enter that is contrary to the word of God does not penetrate it's cast down it's neutralized it's like water hitting a furnace it just pssst, vaporizes starts with a strong mindset 
with a strong mindset, the life is built off of truth. And when the life is built off of truth, it can go forth and free other lives that are in captivity by manifesting its truth into that life that's able or willing to receive it. Luciferian dominion, dominance only is successful if it has a fertile ground in which it can flourish. A ground which is not open to truth. Truth will immediately squash a lie because a lie can't stand against truth. It's darkness. It can't stand against light. It's neutralized. The reason that the human race is in bondage to this day is because it refuses to enter into and even contemplate truth. The Luciferians are shrewd. They understand that you can put a person in captivity and then you can put into that person an unwillingness to set themselves free of the captivity. Try talking to a person who's already got a paranoid belief system. No way in the world you're sure. going to convince them of anything because they've brought themselves into bondage and they have the key and they've swallowed the key. They're determined to stay in there no matter what. Yeah, this is the majority of the human race. <coughs> but let's go on. <coughs> Turn to Ecclesiastes, the 10th chapter, verse 8, <clears throat> on the line of people unwilling to entertain truth. Verse 8, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Now what is he talking about? An individual that breaks down the protection of his mind gate <clears throat> will open himself to influence. He says, the serpent will bite him. The serpent is put within his mind to take down the barrier that's protecting him. And when he does that, the serpent is free to come in and destroy him. Turn to Ecclesiastes 10, verse 11. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. What is he saying here? The unguarded mind is wide open to direction and destruction. And the serpent does not need to allure the individual into destruction. He's got no barrier against influence leading him to destruction. And it says a fool, <clears throat> a babbler is no better. In other words, a fool is somebody that speaks himself into being influenced to destruction. Notice it talks about the serpent, the serpent, the serpent, the serpent spirits. <clears throat> serpent races are the ones that really have the human race in bondage. <coughs> Give us an example of a fool talking themselves into bondage. You have um, let's see. 
Proverbs is a good example of that. Proverbs, the first chapter. Verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee to consent, entice thee, consent thou not. In other words, he's talking to a young man who's already been given wisdom to discern good and evil. He says, if an evil person, young man like you, comes to you and gives you, tries to allure you into doing something you know better than to do, don't do it. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk privily to the innocent without cause, let us swallow them up, alive as a grave in a hole. In other words, individuals that try to get you to think of this as being exciting. Come on, we're going to party. We're going to break into this store. We've got plenty of stuff we can steal and enjoy. And you know better. <clears throat> You're a fool if you allow that to take place because you know better. He's talking here about the preface of it is my son, attend to my word. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Because it's going to protect you. Use wisdom. <clears throat> Evaluate everything you find in life. I'm giving you instruction as a devoted father. If you go against this, this this instruction, you're a fool because it's going to destroy you. Now what happens is people pay attention to the allure of the serpent. Yeah, this guy, drugs. This guy, you know, you see a guy doubled over on heroin or whatever it is, on his way out, the serpent will tell you, this guy is that way because he was weak, but you could deal with this, so go on. Right, right. And you, phew, oh yeah. Yes. You know, Satility. <clears throat> Why H.V.H. reached the point where he saw the whole nation coming under the influence of the serpents. Turn to Deuteronomy 32. We're going to read verses 28. They are a nation void of counsel. Neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Now, <laughs> drop down to verse 32. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. What is he talking about? He's talking about their alcoholics. That the alcohol that they're consuming is putting them in a deviant mindset just like it did those of Sodom and Gomorrah. But it goes on. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. What is he saying? It's the serpent races that are luring them into this consistent dependence upon alcohol. 
Serpent races are behind drugs and alcohol. Yeah. It's not the terrorist nations. It's not the principalities. It's the serpent races. Because they can use their wisdom to detect the person that's vulnerable to alcohol once they begin to go down that path. And they do when they do that, that individual is as good as gone. He can't get out. You can be an alcoholic anonymous for 50 years and be sober and in one day just wipe out over one drink. It's the serpent races. Why? Because the serpent uses utility to gauge your vulnerabilities. As Satan goes about seeking whom he may devour, so do the, the other serpents. And notice what it talks about dragons. <clears throat> Verse 33, their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Now the dragons are the rulers of the serpents in this whole serpentine race situation. The dragon is the one that has the power and the authority. That's why Satan is pictured as a dragon and a serpent. So do you call dragons kings? Mm -hmm. Dragon kings, the serpents are the nations basically. Mm -hmm. So we find that it's the kings that are directing the nations into how to keep the human race vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They scout out, they scope out, the vulnerabilities of the individuals and they direct them into the lives of each individual so that that vulnerability will be his destruction. Mm 